The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Before we start, we have a little DVD. It's about seven minutes long. And I was telling Herb, um, my, my grandfather took the same kind of um, movies. And were, my cousin or somebody had him transferred on a thing just like this. And I was watching his. It's sleigh riding, parties, and this and that. It's like universal behavior, because it looks exactly like the ones my grandfather took. <coughs> The exact same kind of behavior. So this is about seven minutes long. It's got, well, Herb will explain. Yeah, I'll explain. He might point out some things yeah. about Troy. That there's some good scenes of sleigh riding and a view from Prospect Park in the, what year would that have been? Probably in the late 30s, early 40s probably. You'll, you'll see Troy from Prospect Park, a pan, and it's, half those buildings are gone now, I think. I don't know. You'll yeah, have it's to. amazing. Yeah, that's Alan Snyder's family, a friend that I grew up with in Troy. That's his mom, the gray-haired lady on the right. As you notice, back then, people were smoking in their houses, which was a kind of customary thing to do at the time. It looked just like the ones my grandfather took. Right. <laughs> and these are pictures of children acting like children. Even today's children act like children. It's amazing, isn't it? So what year was this? This was probably in the early 60s, I believe. Early 60s. Yeah, this was in the early 60s, this portion of the, the video. These were Alan's family videos that he put on a disc. Alan was in uh, the service during the Vietnam War, and that was his bri uh, war bride that uh, he ended up marrying from South Vietnam. I think that's amazing. Huh? That's Alan's sister and his brother, his younger sister. She's playing the geisha girl, apparently. <laughs> She's really a very nice woman. I've met her over the last few years. This is up in Albia. It's in Albia. Yeah. Near the Post and Kill Creek, actually, I believe. These are vintage cars now. They call them vintage cars. <laughs> <laughs> Back then, they were the daily form of transportation. <laughs> this is Prospect Park years ago. Kids sleighing down, sleigh riding down there. Up in the top of the hill was the playgrounds and the pools. And, That's what kids did in the winter. 
<laughs> then. Now this is 8th Street. If you're looking straight ahead, which doesn't exist anymore, those homes are all gone, but this is the panoramic view of Troy. There's the old Green Island Bridge in the background there. You know, the churches and the buildings and... That's Troy Music Hall. There's the Troy Music Hall down Hall. there. Yeah. This pans all the way down the South Troy with the uh, steel mills and the coke plant. And this is Alan's brother and sister walking, running back up to the car apparently. This particular road you used to be able to drive up in Prospect Park. You can't do that anymore. They have it blocked off. And that's Alan's father. This is 8th Street where I lived. See those line of row houses up there? That's where I lived in one of those homes. This is College Avenue. Pretty right steep in the middle of the road. Right in the middle of the road the kids used to go <laughs> right, and they'd stop on the snow piles across the street. Pretty dangerous in this day and age, but even back then. <laughs> and this was actually 8th Street when they're going down to Congress Street. And what do you see? This one scene. Here you go. There's a car coming around the corner. There's a next. car. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little story to tell you about that as we go along on sleigh riding, but um, this is Allen's backyard. It had a pretty steep hill. That was where they're coming from is the old day home area uh, that's gone now also. <laughs> I like the clothes also and the knitted caps. Yep, they run snowballs down the hill. That's why we used to make big snowmen too. You get a big ball going and you roll it down the hill and that formed the body of the snowman. That corner, that store there is Harry Moore's Corner Store. It doesn't exist. That's on the cover of my first book, the artwork there. I remember doing that myself many times. I want to thank Joe for inviting me here to speak with you folks today. I hope you enjoy that little video. It kind of brings back memories to me. I'm sure some of you have brought back memories also of, of our childhood. And that's what I'm here to talk about today, basically. Um, my name is Herb Hyde. I'm a area local self-published author. I've written several memoirs about growing up in Troy and now I live in Cahos. I'm writing a book on that right now. Uh, it's going to be called Uncle John's Diner, which is takes over when I got out of high school. I got my first job in Cahos um, three weeks after I got out of high school. I had to go to work. We were still on welfare at the time because our family was dirt poor. Uh, but to start off with, I'm going to give you a little family history about myself. Give you a little background. Um, I was born in 1944 up in Swanton, Vermont. Um, my family was kind of transient at times. My father had jobs working for the government. Uh, he was a revenuer, they used to call it, back up in the Canadian border at one point in time. But um, I was born in 1944. We moved to Troy the next year, and we stayed there ever since. But prior to then, um, I'm a, I come from a family of 10 kids. I had three brothers and six sisters. Uh, I've lost all of them except my two youngest sisters, who, um, which is kind of tough. It's, it's great coming from a large family because you, it's a large family. You have somebody to play with, you have you know, somebody to fight with, you have all these kind of things that are pluses. But the tough part about it is that it's a large family and these types of things happen as part of life. And that's what you have to deal with as, as you get older. But um, getting back to my family, uh, my youngest, my oldest brothers and sisters were born during the Depression. And back in that time, everybody was really struggling. And a lot of families that may not have had the income to be able to support their families used to ship their children off to other people's parts of their family. In my particular case, my brother Jack, who's my oldest brother, and my sister Kathleen, who was my oldest sister, were both shipped away to my Aunt Olive, who lived up in Granville, New York. 
And um, they spent several years up there. Jack, in fact, worked on a chicken farm up there as a little boy. And, um, but they had a different kind of relationship with my father because they were the first two kids. My second group of older siblings, my sister Dorothy and my brother Frank, were also shipped away at some point in time to live up in Bennington, where my grandparents lived. Um, they stayed with my older, my father's mother, who was, to say the least, not the most kind type of grandma <laughs> at the time to them. My sister Dorothy uh, said she treated me like Cinderella. She had to do all of the work and she gave her no respect and she didn't really enjoy her time up there. My brother Frank luckily was able to get away earlier, but Dorothy stayed there for several years. And um, eventually we all got back home and one of the stories that my sister Dorothy told me before she passed away when I was writing the first book was that um, she was really kind of upset when she came back home because my mother didn't know she was coming home. They kind of dumped her back to Troy and she didn't know what to do with it because she still didn't have any funds to run the family. My father, my father worked odd jobs. He was, he was kind of a, um, say, difficult husband to say the least. So when I wrote this, this first book, College and Eighth, I kind of describe it as Angela's ashes with a sense of humor because you had to have a sense of humor to deal with what was going on in, in your life. Uh, I read Angela's Ashes actually when I decided to start writing these memoirs after I retired from the state. Um, first time I read it, I said, man, this is dark. And I, I didn't really find it that interesting until I started writing and then I decided to read it again. And I actually fell in love with it because then I could relate to what he was dealing with because our families were similar in some respects. So um, basically, one of the reasons why I started writing, about 20 some odd years ago, um, we had a, a little party at our house. So downstairs one night after everybody left, I, I had this vision of my mother who had passed away back in 1981, <clears throat> of my mom sitting at the kitchen table. She loved to cook, she was a great cook. And back in that era, being a poor family, you had to do with what you had. So you had to be able to cook well. To, you couldn't afford porterhouse steaks and all these goodies, so she'd make a lot of casseroles and spaghetti and meatballs with a real treat and things like that. But one of her favorite foods was baked macaroni. She had a phenomenal recipe for baked macaroni, which I loved. And um, she was sitting at the kitchen table this one day, and I, I had this vision in my mind of her slicing garlic. She used to put like a whole bulb of garlic in this macaroni and cheese. It sounds disgusting, but it was absolutely incredibly tasting. Um, so I had this vision of her, and we're always in her hair all the time. She, you know, we'd drive her crazy, but the kids were out. The other sisters and my older brother, Clifford's out of the house at the time. And I saw her sitting placidly at the kitchen table. It was in the fall, and you could see streams of sunlight coming through the window, and she, she had this long silver hair, and she was at peace with herself, cooking for us. So I wrote this little story about it 20 years ago, and I put it aside. And then when I was going to retire from the state 10 years ago, I came across it again. And when I read it, I started getting all these memories about my childhood in Troy. And the stories that she told me about some of the things that I did, which I remember. My earliest memories go back to age two, actually. And that's one of the stories in this book that she always talked about right until the end of her life, what I did as a kid. But I had these, these little stories in my mind, these little vignettes of what my life was like. I used to get picked on because I was scrawny. I was the youngest kid, in the, one of the younger kids in the neighborhood. And, um, and I'd get bullied, which is part of what goes on today even, but at a different level. So I, I had all these stories in mind, so I started writing them down. And I decided at some point that and then I, I saw what was happening to Troy, and this, this all came back to me too. I go to Troy all the time, but my neighborhood was disappearing slowly. And when I was writing this book, Art Bear was building the Impact Center and tried a big glass box on the hill over there. Beautiful building in its own style, $200 million worth. But um, across the street from her were some of the row houses where my friends and buddies lived. And they were gonna save them. That was the original intent, to save them for visiting artists to stay at their housing. And um, that didn't happen. They let them go into benign neglect. So before I was 
before they're going to tear those buildings down, I was over in Troy standing right where the impact center is, which was where my house was located. And I was standing in their driveway taking pictures because I knew they were going to be gone because I wanted to retain those pictures. And out comes a guy from the, the building. says, what are you doing here? I said, well, what's it look like? I'm t taking pictures of these houses. And he says, why? I said, well, I used to live here as a kid. And I said, you're standing right now in my living room. And he was from Brooklyn, by the way. He was an electrician that was working on their, their electrical work and sound system and everything. So we got talking, and I kind of described what the neighborhood was like to him and everything, So, uh, and that I was writing this book. So eventually, um, I was able to reconnect with 10 of the kids that I grew up with that I hadn't seen in 40, 50 years, luckily. These lot, most of them still live in the area. They were all characters in, that were going to be characters in my book. So um, I was able to get them all together, and we had like five or six of us came over to my house one day, and I said I was going to take notes about, I wanted to verify the stories that I had written. You know, I changed the names of the characters for legal purposes and to protect the innocent and humorless because I was kind of <laughs> kind of make light of some of the things that we did at the time. So they all came over to my house and were sitting in my, in my dining room table and they started telling these stories and I asked them about them. And everybody's talking crazy. Cra uh, it was just like I was a kid again. You know, everybody's <laughs> saying the same things. Oh yeah, you did. You. So I had a recording. I was going to record it because I didn't want to write all this stuff down. So the next day I figured, well, I'll listen to the recording and I can make notes about all this stuff. So the next day I go downstairs and I turn the um, recording machine on. I couldn't understand the word they said. They were all talking over each other. So it was like a, a useless exercise. But in any event, I was able to uh, take this book and, and I kind of, I wanted to create, I didn't have a, a, a formal way of doing a book. I, I decided that because all these were short stories or um, that I wanted to combine them and make it look like a novel. Sort of like Angela's Ashes. So the concept that I used was a tree. Um, and I talk about a tree in my book, actually, hiding in, the, hiding in a tree when I got in trouble one time. But in any event, I look at it as, as a life tree and what happened during my life. You start at point A, and as you go up, you have these branches that go this way, that way, and the other way. And then some of the branches would be my relationships with my kids, on the, my buddies on the street. Another branch might be a relationship with my family, my neighbors. Another branch is uh, my relationship to the kids in school. And the other one would be like the relationships, all the friends that I, and things that I did at the boys club. And another branch would be all of the things that we did together, all the kinds of trouble and stuff that we get into as young kids. And that's how I created that first book. Um, but basically, um, when I published the first book, I, I, I've written this story in various different places. I didn't stay at home to write the books. I, I wanted to get out where I was where I can kind of just get into my own zone and try to write these little stories, put them together. Well, there's a place in Cahoes called the uh, Bread and Jam. It was on Remsen Street in Cahoes. And I had been writing at um, Borders Books up in Clifton Park, and uh, there was a place downtown Cahoes. And I'd write some at home also, of course. But I walked into this place. I'd heard about it this one day. And I walked in the front door. And I thought I worked back into the 1940s. Because inside this building, this little coffee shop, were kitchen tables, just like the kitchen table at my house, with the vinyl chairs and the laminate tops. And they had these overstuffed chairs that you might have in your living room. And I kind of felt like I was home. So I decided that I would start doing my writing there. And I would just get in a zone and I would write. And um, as I went along, I didn't know how good my books were going to be or what if I was doing something right or wrong. So I would have readings down there. They'd have an open mic night or whatever once in a while at this place. They had entertainment. So I would make notification. On, I got on Facebook. Facebook is funny, by the way. I didn't want to get on Facebook. Everybody said, oh, you got to get on Facebook. You want to promote your book and all this kind of stuff. But when I first got on it, I'd get all these people popping up and I'd just X them out. I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to be talking to them all the time because I didn't really know them that well or whatever. But as soon as I got the book ready for completion, everybody that popped up, I started accepting everybody. And now I have like 800 people <laughs> uh, that are on my Facebook page. And um, a lot of them are my friends now, of course. But, uh, 
but that was that was funny. Well, when you write, when you're a self-published author, you don't go out and expect to make money. If you do, you're in the wrong business, because it's very difficult to make money as an author. Uh, you have to do it for several reasons. In my case, I do it because I enjoy meeting people like you. Um, and I'm a very shy guy, as you didn't notice, probably. But I was as a little boy. I was very shy. But um, I do it for different reasons, I think, now. I, I went the traditional route. I tried. I sent my manuscripts to the different publishers. Nobody would answer you. So I, I approached agents. Uh, I, I went to about 10, 15, 20 different places and got no response. So I decided to go to the self-publishing route through the Troy Bookmakers, who, who do a very, very good job, but it's a very expensive process. But in any event, getting back to the bread and jam when I was doing these, these readings, one of the first things I would say, because I wanted to get input back from people, is do you think this is okay? If they moaned or whatever, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have said that. So um, before each time I did a reading, I would preface the conversation with say, and I'll do it with you folks here. Does anybody here think that they have stories that they could write about that you'd like to put down on paper and write for the future? Or you want to write that great American novel? Anybody here ever think of doing that? Okay, you can be brave. You can put your hands up, you know? Okay. Well, then the next question I ask is, why haven't you done it? <laughs> because everybody has a story, and I encourage everybody if you have that story, whether you do it for your family, your neighborhood, your friends, for posterity, just do it. It's amazingly, it's amazing how rewarding it is to you down the road. I learned so many things about myself and my father that I never knew when I wrote this book. I would be in tears when I read back some of the stuff that I read, that I, that I had written. So um, in any event, the bread and jam in Cahos was great. When I did my book launch, Back in 2010, I figured I'd get 10, 15 people. Maybe my family would come and you know, they would sign it. And for whatever reason, I sold 102 books that night, which was, to me was shocking because I didn't think I knew 102 people <laughs> at the time. But, but people apparently had heard about it and they decided to come and uh, they enjoyed the talk. And, uh, but the other beautiful thing about it was those 10 guys that I had met, they all came to the book signing, to the book launch party. And I have pictures of all of us together, just like when we were kids, except we were 50 years older, you know. And uh, that was part of the beauty of that. So that's kind of a background of, um, of what I was doing. But we want to talk about the era that I was raised in back in the, the 40s and 50s. As I, as I told you before, you know, a lot of families that were in the same position as my family were, were dirt poor. And if they weren't dirt poor, they thought they were dirt poor because you suffered a lot during World War II and the Great Depression. You know, it took a long time to recover from all of that, ec economically, emotionally, and um, socially in some respects. But the one thing I do remember, like I told you earlier, the relationship between my father and my older siblings was much better than with the younger ones. Because when we were around, my father was gone a lot. My, my father had a drinking problem, he had some health issues, and my, the relationship between my father and my mother wasn't good. So we were left home alone, and she was left to fend basically by herself. She, had, she was in ill health and couldn't work anymore. So we, we kind of struggled, but we never knew we were struggling. I mean, um, we knew that we had some issues, um, but we didn't know that until we got much older. It was just life. You were just living life as it was, as best you could. I was raised in a three-story, we lived in the third floor of a three-story tenement, which you saw in that video, those set of row houses, the one house with the big steps, and we lived next to that. But as I write in my first book, the, um, that was probably the worst, one of the worst tenements on the street. You know, it was hotter than heck in the summer and colder than heck in the winter. Uh, we heated our house by a coal-burning stove in the parlor, and we had bedrooms adjacent to that. But ironically, we, our house was so bad and so dingy, we had to get used furniture, and we ended up getting bed bugs, which is horrible. That's one of the epidemics that is occurring now across this country for some unknown reason. But I can remember my mom trying to clean this stuff with, with DDT or some kind of toxic chemical just to kill those things. And uh, I'll tell you, once you've been bitten by a bed bug or experienced a bed bug, you'll never forget it because the smell from that insect stays with you forever. So if, I ever, if I'm ever near a place that has bed bugs in it, I'm going to know it. <laughs> I, 
I'd be like a, one of those dogs, those drug-sniffing dogs, but I'd be a, a bug-sniffing dog, apparently. So that's how we started. We had one of the worst apartments up there, but um, but we survived. We we you had to survive. You know, life was what it was. So you found ways of dealing with it. But the thing that I find interesting is that what we did as kids, we were never in the house as children. You're out from sun up to sunrise. You didn't have TVs back then. Um, in the early 50s, a couple of neighbors across the street, we used to call them the rich people on the other side of the street. They were, the fathers all had jobs over there. A lot of the people, a few of the people on our side didn't, like our family. But um, yeah, we were outside. If you notice in a lot of videos going back in that era, you didn't see many really overweight kids at the time. What's the reason you would think that they weren't overweight? First of all, diet. You didn't have all this junk food that's being crammed down your throat today. And you're outside. Kids were playing from sunup to sundown. And they found ways to entertain themselves. You didn't have cell phones. You didn't have iPads. You didn't have the Xbox. You had cardboard boxes that you played in. You made a Ford out of it. You know. Um, I, I, I joke with my little grandson, Shane. He's a sweet little boy. He's, he's going to turn 12 this month. But he's autistic. He has Asperger's syndrome. Very bright young man. So I remember a couple of years ago, I was talking to him. And we, he wants to get a phone like his brother had. I said, Shane, you know what I, we used as a phone when I was a kid? He says, no, what, Grandpa? I said, we used to take soup cans, and we have it attached to a string. And we would go around the corner. We could talk to each other with these soup cans. He said, really? I said, yeah. Why are you going to make me one of those? <laughs> and sadly, I haven't had a chance to make it yet. I feel bad because he just got his first iPhone in turning age 12. And he's got a better one than I got because I got the left, leftover ones from my daughter's account or whatever. So, But that's, those were some of the things that you, you dealt with. Our biggest way of communication back then was radio. Yeah, biggest source of entertainment in that era in the 40s and 50s was radio, movie theaters, and plays in the backyard. You know, during the summertime, um, some of the neighbors would put together an amateur hour or whatever for the kids in the neighborhood, and they would put little plays on in people's backyard. And that was something for the neighbors to look forward to and the kids to look forward to also. So uh, those were some of the things we did there. Uh, as far as games went, um, you know, kids, like I said, kids played outdoors. Life was simpler. The girls always were outside playing. They were playing hopscotch and jacks, and they had roller skates that you would attach to your sneakers. You'd have the little key you lock them in. Remember those? And, and uh, since I couldn't hang out with the bigger boys because they beat the heck out of me most of the time, I'd get bullied. I, I still managed to weasel my way in sometimes, but I would have to end up playing with my sister sometimes. So of course, I took abuse for that too. The only beauty of that, however, was the fact that my sister Patty was a tomboy and she was tougher than most of the kids that were beating the crap out of me. So if they got carried away, she kicked the crap out of them. <laughs> so uh, it was kind of a catch-22 for some of those guys. But like I said, we. Um, during that era, we were pretty much self-contained to a degree at a certain age. We hung out in the neighborhood. We'd go up in Prospect Park. We'd play, when I was a boy, I was a boy of course, still am, uh, but uh, the boys would go play basketball in the morning. Up the street we had built a basketball hoop. Some of the older kids did it for us. And we played basketball in the morning. Then you'd see all the windows go up at noontime. Johnny, Jimmy, come on in, it's lunchtime. You had to go in and eat lunch, a little sandwich or whatever. In our case, we used to have a lot of uh, ground up bologna and onion and mayonnaise. That was a, we called it bologna salad, but they, they probably call it a, a Nelligan made now in some restaurant and charge $10 for it. But uh, yeah, that's what we did. Then when we had lunch, we either went up to the park and played basketball, baseball, or swim in the pool. Prospect Park in Troy had one of the most beautiful pools in the area. It was built, it was a binion, I think it's called a binion pool. And there was only like 50 of them in the entire country. And that's where I learned how to swim up there at Prospect Park Pool. 
And uh, of course, we get all kinds of trouble up in Prospect Park, as we get out all the two. But that's what a lot of the boys did. We'd play pickup games. We'd also play uh, what was called uh, stickball which is a trend that's coming back now in some of the older neighborhoods. In fact, in South Troy now, they have a tournament every year, a stickball tournament, which I have to get into if I ever, I don't know if I could swing a bat again, but it sounds like it would be fun. But we used to pay, play those types of games. We played stickball on Ferry Street. There was a big, Ferry Street in Troy used to connect with Congress Street just before Prospect Park. That whole area is decimated now, as you're probably aware of. If you've been to downtown Troy in the last few years, or in Troy, my neighborhood doesn't exist anymore. Um, but that's where that was all located. And they had alleyways that would interconnect those, those streets together. And we'd play in those alleyways. And there was bars, and there was corner stores. And one of the ways of, uh, aside from us kids playing, um, they used to have concerts up at the park, and every Sunday they have a, a band up there playing music. And uh, we'd also have, in our neighborhood, a way of dealing with hot summer nights and communicating with each other. Back in that era, corner stores, College and Eighth, Eddie Moore's store, uh, Harry Moore's store, which is on the cover of my book, that was where families like myself would go to buy their goods. You didn't have big supermarkets. They had a few were coming out at that point in time, but you didn't have these mag, these these monster supermarkets that had everything. But at the corner store, you you could get your basic needs taken care of. Um, you know, they had cold cuts. You could buy those. You can buy canned meats. You can buy soda. And they had penny candy back then. Real penny candy. You actually pay a penny for your candy. Now you pay a dime or a quarter or half a buck for penny candy. In some of these stores, it's amazing. But the way that people communicated, it was kind of interesting. The corner store was mostly for men in my neighborhood. They would be bitching and complaining, pardon my language, about the wives or the neighbors or whatever. And the women in the summertime would be sitting on stoops, your, what do you call porches, or we used to call stoops. So the women would be sitting on the east side of the street talking, and the men would be on the other side of the street drinking beer and playing cards. And the women would be complaining about the men and all the things that went on in the neighborhood and vice versa, apparently. So <laughs> that was all part of the communication network back then. Now you have Facebook <laughs> and Twitter and all these other things, and soap operas, of course, on TV, which I don't care to look at. But, um, and then in the summer, um, like some of the younger, or the older boys and the older men would go up uh, School 14, which is at the top of College Avenue in Troy, and they'd have beer games in the summertime. They'd all chip in and get a keg of beer or whatever, and they'd play softball. And, uh, and then they'd all go over to the Army Grill, which doesn't exist anymore, which was at the top of College Avenue in Troy. And uh, they'd go over there and finish the night off over there or whatever. So one of the things I always mentioned about, and I mentioned in my book about Troy, was one of the things that was unique that Troy had, and a lot of communities had, was that there was a, seemed to be a bar in every corner. But I think in Troy it was a little bit different. I think it was on every half a block. I mean, you couldn't walk two blocks without running into five different grills. You know, it was amazing. But maybe the, one of the reasons for that was Troy had a significant amount of breweries back then. You know, you had the Stanton Brewery, which was on Short Fifth Avenue, we called it, right in the base of Prospect Park. And you had Fitzgerald's Brewery, which was up on River Street. And you had Quants, and you had a whole series of these different breweries that created jobs for people that you don't have anymore. You know, you don't have that kind of industrial base. But when I talked about Fitzy's Brewery, I knew some people that worked there. And one of the perks at Fitzy's Brewery back then was when you worked there, you could get all the beer you wanted for free. So guys at lunchtime, would be, they'd be going home half loaded after putting a hard day's work, you know. But that, that's what life was like uh, on those days. Another thing I want to talk about is parochialism in Troy. Neighborhoods are neighborhoods, and everybody was proud of their neighborhood. I lived on Ida Hill, you know, college in eight. And then you had people in South Troy, um, they called it South Troy against the world. Anything below the Post and Kill Creek is considered South Troy. Ida Hill is any, where the marketplace is in Troy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's on Fifth Avenue and Fourth Street. Uh, that's where all the Italian kids hung out. And then Lansingburg had the burgers. They had their own little neighbor. And then you had Central Troy, which was around Middleburg Street. 
But everybody was proud of their neighborhoods. So we would have games, we'd have pickup baseball games between South Troy or Lansingburg or the Market Street. But they also had, believe it or not, in, when I was a young kid, they had gangs, little delinquents. And um, I, rec I, I talk about one of the things, I was only about five years old when this one happened. There was a fight between the Ferry Street gang. There were kids that lived on Ferry Street here, their old gang, they were older kids usually and uh, the market gang. And I still remember this vividly to this day. I was, one of my neighbors took me down to her sister-in-law's house in Rock Alley. Rock Alley was a little alleyway that ran from Congress Street over to Ferry Street. On the corner of Rock Alley was Sticklemeyer's Grill. There were two of them at the time, one there and one down on uh, Sixth Avenue by the railroad tracks. But I remember she brought me over and they heard that there was gonna be this fight happening over whatever happened, the, the market gang was going to have a fight with the Ferry Street gang. And um, all I remember, and I still remember this, was it was getting dusk out, getting dark out, and all of a sudden you saw this horde of people coming up over the hill up in Prospect Park with old brooms they had set on fire, like a, you know, back, back in the Middle Ages or something, you know, medieval times. And they had this massive fight, and one of the leaders of the, the Ferry Street gang got hit over the head with a rake. His name was Stewie Reed. He ended up in the hospital. He ended up okay, but, but those kind of things even went on back then. You know, this great time that we, we look back at and we love and, and we relish, but there were things that went on back then that were kind of different, kind of delinquent, things like that. But everybody that usually that I talk to looks back in time and says, those were the good old days, you know? I miss those old times. And I do, and I did, and we all do, I think. So, um, one of my other experiences was, because of the fact that I get bullied a lot as a little kid, um, they'd find reasons to pick on me, and, um, and I would try to fight back at times. But, but my mother was a little bit worried about me, so she, Dom Gerasitano, who was the director of the Troy Boys and Girls Club at the time, back in the late 40s, right up until the early 60s, I believe. Um, he lived across the street from us. So she talked Don, Dom to uh, see if he could get me into the Boys Club so I could get off the street after school and get away from these guys, be a safe haven for me. Well, you had to be seven years old at the time to get into the Boys Club, but I was only like four and a half, five. But Don was able to get me into the Boys Club. Ironically, however, my mother didn't realize that some of the older kids that were picking on me went to the boys club too. <laughs> so, so it was kind of like a catch-22. But the boys club, in reality, became a safe haven to me uh, as a little kid. Because I, I, I got involved in various things, played my sports down there. We'd have arts and crafts after school. Um, and I joined the harmonica band. There's a, they had this phenomenal group. They, I think it started in the early 40s, late 30s, right up until the late 50s. Uh, this fellow who was an insurance salesman was the head of it. So they got me involved. Uh, I had asthma, so I had a hard time playing the harmonica because of my breathing issues. Um, but they wanted me to be their singer. I, had, I was a boy soprano at the time. So I was in the boys club and, and what we would do, um, we would go around to all these social clubs and uh, like the Rotary Club and other business clubs also. And we would play at luncheons or they'd have a special dinner or whatever. We used to play at the Troy Club and things like that. And it was a way of the boys club raising money because people would donate to the boys club to have us go entertain them. So that was, that was kind of what I did during that period of time. The good thing about being in the Boys Club Harmonica Band and being a singer was that when I had these lunchtime programs and I was in grade school, they would come to the school and I would be able to get out of school <laughs> for a couple of hours to go play at these, these little events down at Hendrick Hudson Hotel or we played at the Tavern in Troy. And we, luckily, we were on TV a few times. We were on, um, I don't know if any of you remember the old TV shows on Channel 6 way back when. You had Howard Tupper was the weatherman, and then you had Ernie Tatro was, uh, he also did the weather at some point in time. But uh, there was a show called The Sonny and Ernie Show. They did it at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I remember going to that show, and we were gonna be on it, 
and Ernie Tatro was on a unicycle, these gigantic unicycles. You're going to try, drive it across the, this thing, and he almost fell off the darn thing. But uh, yeah, we sang a Gary Stevens show, Earl Putney. Um, we would go on, and it, again, getting back to the smoking issue that you saw in that video, all the guys in the band at the studio were smoking cigars. <laughs> it was kind of ironic. But at that point in time, who knew, you know, how dangerous smoking would be or whatever. But that's some of the things that we're, we were able to do, and that kind of got me away from some of these other things that were going on in my life. So um, that was kind of fun. You probably, some of you also remember um, telephones. Remember, do you remember your first telephone? You, you had party lines and things like that. And you wanted to make a call and you get on, it was a party line, you listen to everybody else's conversation. So you can get your gossip that way too, if you just want to listen apparently. But uh, you know, those were the first things that came about. Um, movies were the other thing. Um, my mother found that one of the ways that you could get a little respite, uh, hopefully I'm running out of time here, but a little respite is that um, if she could scrounge up enough money, she could send us to the State Theater in Troy to go to a movie on a Saturday afternoon. Well, back then, uh, when you went to the movies, you had two movies, you had cartoons, you had two feature shows. So you could be there for two, three, four hours at a time. But back then, it only cost like 15 cents to go to the State Theater. That was the cheap one, but it was the worst, at the time, was probably one of the most beat up ones. So uh, when she had enough money, she'd ship me and my sisters off to the State Theater to watch movies on a Saturday afternoon, and she could get a little bit of a break from us. But on top of that, when I got involved with the boys on the street, downtown Troy was a magnificent place, believe it. They had more movie theaters per capita, I think, than any city in the area. I mean, you had the State Theater on 4th Street, you had the Lincoln Theater on 3rd Street, you had the Griswold Theater right next to Freer's on uh, 3rd Street, you had the Troy Theater, you had Proctor's Theater, you had the American Theater, which became the Cinema Art Theater, which they're now going to hopefully reopen and renovate it and put a nice new theater in downtown Troy. And then up on, on Hoosick Street, you had the Palace Theater in Hoosick and I think it was 6th Avenue. And then Lansingburg, all you folks from Lansingburg remember the Baiju Theater. Right? Well, as young kids, since we didn't have a lot of money and we had a lot of time on our hands, uh, like on a Saturday afternoon or a Friday evening, we're out sneaking around the city or whatever, we found ways of getting into these movie theaters very conveniently without any money. We used to sneak into all these theaters. We found a way of sneaking into these theaters. And um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I remember we snuck into the um, Lincoln Theater once on a Saturday afternoon. We knew the owner's son, and we kind of conned him into opening the back door for us so we could get into the movie this one day. And his father was a tough guy. He smoked a cigar. He was kind of a grumpy old guy, you know. And, uh, so he opens, the, it's like one o'clock in the afternoon. And we knock on the door and Seth, his name was, comes opening the door. So we all sneak in. He said, you gotta go around this way and go up, and go up in the balcony. Okay, well the one thing we didn't realize where we were going to the seats was right in front of the screen, like the screen we had here. The problem is you could see everybody, <laughs> these little stick figures walking across the back of the screen. So needless to say, once we got up on the balcony, we started creating some havoc, like throwing popcorn on kids down below us or whatever, and they started screaming that the owner came up looking for us, and we then scooted out the front door before he could grab us at all. But I guess his son had a, a little bit of punishment to pay for that, for letting his buddies in that day. But those were some of the kind of things we used to do. Back in the 50s, I remember in Troy, Troy was like, always reminded me, I don't know if you people feel the same way about it, but I always thought of Troy as being like a miniature New York City. They had squares, like Times Square or whatever. We had the Market Square where the Market Block books are. You had Franklin Square, which was above that. Then you had Monument Square where they filmed Ironweed in downtown Troy. Very beautiful Victorian um, buildings. Troy at one time was probably one of the wealthiest communities in the country back in the 1800s because of all the industry that they had back then. But you go down to Troy on a Friday night, it was wall-to-wall -wall people. This was you know, into the mid-60s. Uh, you had all these shops, um, 
you had, you had department stores, you had five and dime stores, you had freers, you had the big department stores like Denby's and Peerless and the town shop, and then you had probably the, the department stores we could go to, which was Grant's and, and Stanley's. And um, there were more moderate income places where you could actually afford to buy their stuff. But it was like, it was like an event. You, you go out on a Friday night and everything was bustling. Um, you had a traffic cop uh, directing traffic down by Paul's, Paul's restaurant in Troy, big burly guy. And you didn't mess with him. You know, he directed traffic. You went across the street, you, you got chewed out pretty, pretty good. And, and Troy felt safer back then. A lot of communities felt safer because you had foot patrols out there. Um, and people, you didn't have the concerns that you have today walking into a, an urban city now in some cases that are desolate. And hopefully Troy is recovering now. I mean, like I said before about Troy and bars, you couldn't go around the corner. They had nightclubs. They had, when we were in high school, we used to go down to Al, Hi Al Allen Stiders. He's the fellow that donated that video that we watched earlier. Uh, we would go down to these different bars like Dukes and the Siena. Uh, and then you had the pen and pencil and all these places that you could drink at because the drinking age was only 18 back then. They changed that later. And of course, they had illegal drinking. I mean, we were drinking, I hate to say this, but when we were about 12 years old, if we'd go down to a bar in Troy, as long as you put your dime on the bar and reach your hand up, they put a glass of beer in it, you know? So, so uh, we were drinking really early back then. That was our, our drug of choice. They didn't have this epidemic of opioids and cocaine and marijuana and all that kind of stuff back in our era. That started, I think, really started probably during the Vietnam War era. It became more prolific. But, uh, but that's what it was like downtown in Troy. You had great restaurants. I mean, you had um, Manories, which was a good, really great place to eat. Alan and my, one of Alan and my favorite places was uh, the famous lunch. You know, you go down on Friday night, I'd steal some coins from my father if he was home, or, or he wasn't home, and he'd left some change on his end table. I'd grab 30 cents or whatever, put it in my pocket. We'd run down to the famous lunch and get our nickel hot dogs. You know, and somebody played the jukebox, and they had all those great old songs in the jukebox, and that's where we always met some of our buddies, too. And I write about one of the stories that we had a, we had a fight with the Water Elite Gang in, in College and Eighth, where we all got together at the, the famous lunch and um, that was our meeting ground. But that was one of the, the fun places. You had Charlie's Hot Dogs, which is a, still in business today, up in Lansingburg. People in Lansingburg know that place, right? And in, in uh, Maplewood and Cahoes, like, uh, they have another one there. But the famous lunch was always our favorite. I still think it's probably the best out of all of the hot dog places. But they used to have battles, you know, who liked Charlie's over the famous lunch or whatever. And right next to the famous lunch was a newsroom called Wal was it Walsh's newsroom now? The newsroom across the alley from the famous lunch. What they used to play cards in the back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They'd have all their gambling in the back of these these places back there. And they had pizzerias all over the place too. You know, Patrick Hilly's and the, the Volcano and the Red Front. Uh, the bad, one of the best places now was up in the Naughty Pine in Troy, up on uh, 15th Street. Clem Zotto's family ran it for a while. He was coach at Troy High uh, for several years when they had the number one basketball team in the country back in 1965. But getting back to what it was like back then, it was, it was, it was a bustling community. You had industry back then. This was before we had all of these corporate, I call it corporate flight when companies started to uh, change and try to move these industries off offshore or whatever. So we lost a lot of the industries. You know, a lot of the, the, we had a coke plant down in South Troy. I was doing a little reading on this before I decided to do this presentation. Because I remember the coke plant as a kid. In the summertime, around 11 o'clock at night, you hear this horn blow, and this was way down in South Troy, and I was on 8th Street. And all of a sudden, you see this big cloud of orange smoke coming up and filling the air over South Troy. Well, that's where the coke plant was, was. That was in existence until 1951. And they used to make gas to heat your homes with at that plant. They'd take soft coal from Pennsylvania and they'd process it uh, in a way to, to, to create this liquid gas or whatever. And they'd store it in these storage facilities around the area. But when Niagara Mohawk, when they started going to natural gas, that kind of put them out of existence. 
So uh, Niagara Mohawk actually, I believe, owned that property for a while, and then uh, Republic Steel was down there, and they worked there f for years before they went out of business. And then you had Allegheny Steel over in Waterville. Uh, you had paper mills. We had people that lived on my street that worked at the uh, uh, paper mill in uh, Waterville. Um, they had careers, 30-year careers there. And uh, same thing in Gahoz, you had Mohawk paper, and you had all these textile mills. Uh, had a lot of women in Troy worked at Tiny Town Togs. I don't know if anybody knows that. So I think it's on Adams Street and First Street or River Street. It's, it's now uh, the furniture store down there, the Brook. I think it's the Brook Furniture Store or whatever. But that employed thousands, you know, hundreds of people over the years, and Kluitz was one of the biggest shirt manufacturing companies in the world at the time, plus a lot of other small industries. A lot of them were run by hydropower off of the um, Post and Kill Creek. They had little shops along the Post and Kill Creek that made all kinds of different things. Um, but you had, that, you had that industrial base that kind of supported the community. But since we didn't have televisions, and a lot of people didn't have cars, and the urban sprawl didn't start spreading until probably this, the 1960s, when they, all these shopping centers started springing up. And somebody had this tremendous brain, well, I have another name, I won't use the name here, but they had this idea that, well, we'll build these shopping malls and we'll make them like downtowns where people, but you'd have parking, okay? Where parking's always an issue, right? We'll have these sprawling parking lots and we'll put all these buildings with shops, clothing stores, food stores, theaters and stuff in these shopping malls. So people who now were more mobile would, and gas was cheap, gas, you could buy gas back then at 19, 20 cents a gallon, believe it or not. So it was cheap way of transportation. So people started exiting the cities and then they decided to start urban renewal. Well in Troy they started in the mid 60s and they, I think it was Governor Kerry was governor at the time and he was gonna fund redeveloping the area in Troy that they wanted to tear down. So they actually, if you went to, if you look at old pictures of Troy, you'll see River Street and Ford Street, and they had all these shops. You had shoe shops and, and uh, five and dime stores and, and restaurants and all kinds of things located on those streets, candy shops, Chinese restaurants, uh, drug stores. Well, they started tearing these down with the thought that, oh, well, they're going to put up an atrium that looked like a mall or whatever. And what ha ended up happening, that sat vacant for several years before a developer, everything kind of fell through after they tore it down. Now you got all these buildings and businesses are missing, and you've lost the heart of the city. That communal thing that we would see on a Friday night where people would be walking the streets and saying hi to the cop, and you have the Salvation Army workers ringing the bell. That wasn't happening anymore to that degree. People were moving out to the suburbs. They were starting to go to the shopping centers. Then they came up with this brilliant idea they were gonna put in a parking garage and an atrium next to the fair building, which they did. The atrium's not bad. I mean, it's a nicely designed building and it's functional to a degree. But if they weren't, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, so short-sighted, if they waited a few years, instead of hoping that they're gonna get this money from the state that they never got, if they had renovated those buildings, upgraded them at the time, because now that's what people want. They want to, they want to move back to these urban centers, these, these people in, that are, these technology people that have these jobs and set up uh, business in these, these inner city communities. They want to have walking communities again, which you didn't have. Go to a mall now, at my age. Try to find a parking spot. Walking is like torture to us now, or to me. You gotta walk like three miles to get into the mall, and then you got about five miles of walking inside the mall to get to where you wanna go. And by the time you get out, you're exhausted. Well, in downtown Troy, you could walk three doors and sit in a coffee shop or a little restaurant, have something to drink, a coffee, or go to the Puritan restaurant in Troy, which was a phenomenal restaurant. Uh, they had the best lemon meringue pie. I remember my sister Dorothy taking me there on a Saturday afternoon. She'd go shopping at Stanley's or whatever, pick up something for my mom, and we'd go in there for a lemon meringue pie. It wasn't quite as good as my mom's, but it was second best in any event. It was good. But, you know, that's, that's the thing that bothers me about what happened, because you're looking at Troy now and other cities like Schenectady or whatever. They're trying to restore their downtowns. Remember I talked about stoops and porches and stuff like that? That's how you communicated. Back then, we had our ups and our downs, but maybe with some of our neighbors, but you were neighbors. You know, when kids got into trouble on our street, 
you didn't get away with nothing on our street. If you were, you were having a problem and getting into trouble, everybody knew about it because somebody saw it. You know, I write in a story in there about the chicken man story about when, uh, when we were little kids, um, we used to have chuck, I know it was chuck rows or one of the uh, chicken manufacturers, let's call it, businesses downtown would have a truck that would go deliver live chickens to the neighborhoods. And um, they would have this flatbed truck with all these cages with live chickens in them. Yeah. And um, we were just little kids, and we didn't understand what was going on with these chickens. But one of the protagonists in my book, Denny, lived next door to this guy who used to get live chickens every, every week. And he'd hear this horrible thing going on in his backyard. He couldn't figure out what it was. Well, this guy was making his chickens ready for dinner the next day, so to speak. So I wrote this little story about what we did when the chicken man came to our neighborhood, when, they, when we let all the chickens out, what, what kind of a nightmare it was. Because we wanted to protect the chickens. We didn't want them to get killed. So uh, those were kind of, but guess what happened? We thought we got away with it. We didn't because our parents knew all about it and we ended up paying restitution for the chickens that got hurt or whatever.